the next reflex that we're going to talk about is, is a withdrawal reflex. And this is uh, oftentimes called the nociceptive withdrawal reflex or the flexor withdrawal reflex. And the, the basic uh, notion here is that information from the, of, of a tissue damaging type is picked up by a nociceptor, which brings that information into the uh, central nervous system. In this case, I've drawn here uh, the spinal cord. This could be the hindbrain. But in comes the information from the nociceptor, and it synapses on a central neuron, which goes through a, a number of neurons. Now, the, the fact of the matter is we don't know exactly how many neurons it goes through. So we can, we can wave our hands at this. But this is a polysynaptic. There are more than, uh, than one synapse. And in fact, it's not disynaptic. It's more than two synapses. So it's some number of synapses that takes this information from the nociceptor, processes it probably in the dorsal horn, possibly in the superficial dorsal horn, although I didn't uh, draw it that way. And then the information gets passed along through a variety of, uh, processed through a variety of different cells until it finally reaches a motor neuron that excites a flexor. And so the classic withdrawal reflex is you put your hand on, on a hot stove, and a moment later, you withdraw it. Well, that's your flexor, OK? So you're, and, and there are many interesting things about this, many differences than, than what we see with the 1A reflex um, or the 1B reflex, which is that this is the, the, the withdrawal field is from the skin, OK? It's not from a muscle. It's from the skin. It's from some tissue, not necessarily a muscle. A and the uh, segment, say, of the spinal cord that is responsible for receiving the sensory input may be very distant from the segment that controls the uh, muscle uh, involved in withdrawing from that stimulus. And um, added to the complexity of, of multiple synapses, unclear, unknown number, and identity of synapses uh, that support the flexor uh, withdrawal is the fact that this information is also sent to the contralateral side to excite extensor muscles. And so if you, if you can imagine, think about a quadruped as the quadruped withdraws from uh, noxious stimulation, they better have the rest of their limbs extended out so that they don't fall down. And so we're not different. If, if, if I step on something with one foot and I'm going to withdraw that, I better have my other foot extended. Otherwise, I'm going to fall down. I may fall down anyway. Um, OK, so uh, the, these are polysynaptic reflexes. And there are a number of polysynaptic reflexes. But this is probably the mo clinically the most important one. Now. How do those polysynaptic reflexes, how does the withdrawal reflex get set up? And the somatosensory system is no different than, say, the vision, visual system or the hearing system in, in that you don't, you're not born knowing uh, how, wh where, what input from different parts of the body means. You, you learn what it means. So you have to learn that action potentials of this type, that, oh, that means that somebody's touching my, uh, my, my uh, third finger, OK? Or that means that somebody's touching my pal the palm of my hand. You have to assign, through experience, a meaning to every sensory uh, stimulus. And one way in which this happens is through what's, called, what's been termed somatosensory imprinting. And this is just a, a way that, what, that it's thought to happen, is that uh, there are sensory inputs that come in from a wide variety of places. And they reach a neuron, which is a hypothetical neuron, which is call, called a reflex encoder. We don't know exactly who this neuron is, but it is, uh, we can physiologically record from it. We don't know what it looks like or, or what it's uh, molecular characteristics are, but we know that there is a, a neuron that has these, char these physiological characteristics. And it's excited by various uh, inputs from, let's say, the foot. 
And in return, it excites uh, motor neurons that lead to a withdrawal of the, of, the, of the foot from the area that was stimulated. And that leads to a strengthening of those uh, synapses. Okay, so the withdrawal, if, as long as the withdrawal field matches the receptive field, what's withdrawn? And we're not talking about a big withdrawal. We're talking about the fact that under most circumstances, the withdrawal will be, you, you lift your fingers if, if your fingers hurt or, or you lift your palm. So the withdrawal field should match the, the part of the field that is stimulated. And this is the type of thing that uh, individuals learn learn through somatosensory experience. All right. Now, the next, the, the final thing that I want to talk about with, with respect to reflexes, um, and we'll pick this up again, but it, is the fact that reflexes are not, they're, they're not uh, absolute. They are modulated. Sometimes they happen and sometimes they don't. Well, you think of reflexes as an automatic, but they're not. Uh, you could go in, you could sit at the doctor's office and not have your, uh, not have a stretch reflex. It doesn't take much to not get a stretch reflex. All you have to do is put a little intention into it and not let your, your leg move. You can override the stretch reflex. And uh, even if, if that wasn't the case, there are a number of, of reflexes, and these are clinically important. These are what are called primitive reflexes. And I want to point, uh, take your attention to two of them. One is the root reflex. And this is a reflex that where stimulation anywhere around here, the mouth is turned towards the stimulus. So you stimulate on the cheek, mouth is turned there. Stimulate here, mouth is turned here. Well, what might that be useful for? So anything you stimulate, mouth is turned there. Well, it's, it's your root, the baby is rooting for the nipple. That is the way the baby is going to get the nipple in their mouth. So they're going to get somatosensory stimulus. They're close, they're close, but now they got to turn their head and get that nipple inside their mouth. Now when the nipple is inside their mouth, it touches the upper palate, is the most sensitive spot, and that is then the suck reflex that elicits, um, so touching of the upper palate is going to um, elicit a suck reflex. And so that, I mean, obviously that's really critical to life. You gotta have a root and a, and a suck reflex in order to live or else you're gonna have to be fed by a tube. And that does happen. So there are definitely conditions, um, sensory neuropathies, these hereditary sensory autonomic neuropathies uh, where Babies are born without the ability to, uh, to, to to suck. They don't root. They don't suck. They don't have enough sensory afferents to allow them to do that. But in in healthy uh, individuals, the the root and the suck and these other various uh, reflexes are transiently very active. They're active for anywhere from a few months to a few years, um, but then they're suppressed then they're suppressed unless something goes wrong. And when something goes wrong, you can have a release of the primitive reflexes. So one example of that, one very important example of that, is that if there is a lesion in motor control center, descending motor control centers, and we'll, we'll look at this again, um, so a lesion, let's say, in the corticospinal tract, then you can have uh, the Babinski reflex, which is uh, the plantar reflex. So a firm stroke to the sole elicits a dorsiflexion of the large toe, fanning of the remaining toes. That happens normally for the first two years of life. And then it starts to get to suppressed. So in a, in a healthy adult, there should be no Babinski reflex. There should be no Babinski sign, I should say. There should be no plantar reflex. But in an individual with a cut, a lesion in the corticospinal tract, that plantar reflex makes a, a recurring visit. Um, other of these primitive reflexes can, can be released by frontal lobe damage. So a variety of different damages, a variety of damage to a variety of different places in the central nervous system can lead to a release of a variety of these primitive reflexes. And so that's a very important thing to remember from a clinical perspective. 
Okay, so we're gonna now leave reflexes largely behind and turn our attention to central pattern generators.